listen to uh, and hear from uh, Max Rushbrook, Rushbrook, I'm sorry, and Oliver Hartwich. Uh, and I don't know if it's fair to either of you to say you're from the left and the right, but I've just said it. We, we're hoping that you'll be in violent disagreement uh, with each other uh, so that this is all uh, very interesting. Um, and I think what we'll do, gentlemen, is we'll hear from you each in succession and then we'll take uh, questions uh, together. Um, and so, Max, we, um, we welcome you and we look forward to your remarks. Well, kia ora koutou, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you all. Um, and thank you very much to the previous speakers who have been exceptional, um, as Kitty Adam was saying. Uh, so my background is mostly in researching economic inequality, um, work that I'm continuing as the current JD Stout uh, Research Fellow at Victoria University. And I guess I wanted to focus my remarks on the fact that economic inequality uh, leaves some people in a more precarious position than others and will lead to very different experiences of the coronavirus crisis, uh, but also the opportunity that we have to push back against that. And I guess I, I start with thinking about the graphs that the Treasury has been producing about the enormous fall in GDP that we're currently facing. Uh, and even on the most optimistic scenario, that looks like a very deep uh, V. It looks a lot like a, a ravine, if you like, or a crevasse. And I think the reality is that um, some people in New Zealand through the, the wealth um, and other things that they've accumulated will have the resources to, to get across that ravine. They'll be able to build themselves a bridge across it, if you like, metaphorically. Uh, other people will not and are at very high risk of falling um, into that uh, crevasse. The, and, and if I think about the last major uh, crisis that we experienced in this country, the global financial crisis, now I think our government did a better job of getting us through that than did many governments overseas, and I want to pay tribute um, to the people involved in that. Nonetheless, we did see a, a differential experience of that crisis. Um, if you look at incomes for the richest tenth of New Zealanders, they barely fell at all between 2009 and 2010, and then very rapidly picked up again. Whereas incomes for the poorest tenth of New Zealanders uh, fell distinctly and didn't recover their 2009 level until about 2015. Um, so they were much more severely affected. And even that temporary experience of poverty is very worrying because we know that, for instance, um, children who have been poor at some point in their childhood end up with lower reading scores than children who are never poor. They also have worse health than children who are never poor. So even temporary poverty leads, leaves these kind of scars. And if we look at the situation that people are in going into uh, this crisis we're, we're now experiencing, a uh, very large number of New Zealanders don't have the kind of wealth or asset base that would enable them to ride out this crisis and to, to build a bridge across that metaphorical ravine. Um, we know from the Household Economic Survey in 2018, the average, that's the median New Zealand household, had only $8,000 in cash in the bank in terms of you know, readily available liquid assets. We know from other surveys that year that 25% of households reported having no cash in the bank at all. Um, so a lot of people who aren't well placed coming into this crisis. So I think there, there are real issues here. Um, in terms of how we deal with that and sort of what our vision is for, you know, helping those people collectively uh, survive through the crisis. And if I could just mention a, a personal anecdote briefly. Um, one of my distant ancestors, Harry Atkinson, was once in your shoes. He was a um, member of parliament for much of the latter half of the 19th century in New Zealand. Um, and he was a farmer originally um, from the Taranaki he was a man who believed very strongly in hard work, self-reliance and thrift. But as he observed the, the economic devastation that was wrought by the long depression um, in New Zealand, he saw how overwhelmed individuals and even communities were um, by those economic shocks and the inability of their own schemes to help them through. And so he became an early proponent of national insurance. And he said in 1882, uh, the only effectual remedy against pauperism seems to me to be not private thrift or saving, 
but cooperative thrift or insurance, and that to be thoroughly successful must be national and compulsory. And I think that's a vision that, that multiple governments, successful governments of different stripes have, have renewed over the years. And so I guess the, the challenge uh, that we face now is how do we renew that vision, both in the, in the immediate short term, in terms of building a bridge across the ravine for everyone in this country, uh, but also sort of refounding our ideas about collective insurance and how we help everyone get through crises. So I'd invite members of the committee to think about things like greater stability and security um, for people who are in the workforce at the moment, but risk losing their jobs. We spend about a third as much as some other countries on what are called active labor market programs, you know, really smart tailored programs that help people retrain, um, help them find work. So they don't have security of their existing job necessarily, but security of attachment uh, to the workforce. Uh, for precarious workers, how do we ensure that being in the gig economy doesn't mean you lead an unstable life? Um, why don't we have a 21st century welfare system where, you know, if you have a sudden drop in income one week, inland revenue is getting the information in real time from your employers and in real time it can top your benefit up to some minimum amount. Uh, for benefits more generally, um, I'm not a fan of the universal basic income. Uh, which I think is unaffordable and spreads its assistance too thinly. But do we need to think about something like a guaranteed minimum income so that everyone who has no other source of support has an amount of, has guaranteed an amount of money on which they can lead a decent life and rewards them for doing socially useful things um, like looking after elderly relatives. In housing, you know, I'd like to see much greater security there for people. Um, I'd like to see a bigger push on public affordable housing, but again, modernized, renewed for the 21st century, making greater use of prefabricated techniques, for instance, which are both cheaper uh, and more environmentally friendly. And even just in terms of wealth itself, um, I'd like to see greater use of things like something like a Kids Kiwi Saver scheme, which a couple of different parties have proposed, you know, so that there are public incentives for families, poor families to save, which will mean that children will reach 18 who would otherwise, through no fault of their own, had no asset base behind them, will actually reach you know, the age of maturity with some kind of savings base. And then finally, you know, in addition to all these things, once we've got across the immediate crisis that we face, I think we'll need to think about how we apportion the burden, the financial cost of dealing with that, um, I note that another former Prime Minister, Bill English, has said that, you know, if the share market recovers quickly and there's a sense that maybe pain isn't being shared equally, capital gains tax might need to be back on the table. People like Gareth Keenan from Infometrics have talked about a wealth tax and other such ideas. Um, obviously, there'll be a range of views about that on the committee, but whatever your views there, I would just like to reinforce the message that you know, we do risk having very different experiences of this crisis. There is an urgent need to build a bridge across this impending ravine for all of us uh, to walk across. And I would really urge you to recognize that, you know, thinking about these kinds of precarity and inequality issues can't be an add-on. Um, it needs an absolutely relentless focus and a real drive to renew those ideas of stability and security, which I think have always been at the heart of what it means to live well in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Max, thank you so much. This is excellent. And uh, I, sh I should have said at the start, Max is a, um, a writer and uh, amongst his many publications and books uh, is Inequality in New Zealand Crisis. Next, we'll go to uh, Oliver Hart, which Chief Executive of the New Zealand Institute, Initiative, I should say. Indeed. Thank you, you Mr. Vying, you two are vying for best bookshelf. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you, and thank you indeed for the work of this committee over the past weeks. While Parliament was suspended, you have ensured that parliamentary scrutiny continued. And in this time of extraordinary executive powers, we must uphold and defend our liberal democratic values. You and your parliamentary colleagues of all parties have done that, and New Zealanders thank you for it. You invited me to present a vision for New Zealand's social, political and economic future. 
So it is appropriate to begin with a word about our present. New Zealand and the world are facing a crisis like none before. This crisis is like a war in which we mourn our dead and care for the sick. It is like a recession in which many of us lose our jobs and livelihoods. It is like a natural disaster in which the world we knew and loved is crumbling before our eyes. I have not come here to deny the severity of our situation. It is grave, but I've come here to offer a ray of hope. No matter how dark our predicament, a brighter future is always possible because our future is always up to us. As an economist, for me, a bright future will deliver prosperity for all. You may think I'm dreaming. Forecasters warn us of rising debt, bankruptcies and mass unemployment. So how can I have the audacity to imagine a future bringing prosperity for all? I was born in 1975 and raised in West Germany. So I come from a country that in its history has not only experienced many crises, it is a country that has brought great suffering to the world, including its own people. And yet, despite the great disasters of two lost world wars, I grew up in one of the most prosperous, democratic and livable countries in the world. From what my parents and grandparents have told me, the immediate post-war time was tough. My parents were born in 1946 and 1947. It is hard to understand how my grandparents were optimistic enough to have children in bombed out cities in which food was rationed and in which life was literally in ruins. And yet, it was also a time of hope. A great evil, National Socialism, had been defeated, but a great promise, prosperity for all, was given. Prosperity for all was the catch cry of Ludwig Erhard. Ludwig Erhard was an economist. The Allied forces gave him the seemingly thankless task of organizing the post-war economy. So how do you get an economy going again when entire industries are destroyed? How do you encourage private consumption when families are trying to make ends meet? How do you run a government when public finances are in disarray? These are the questions that will also be on your minds as New Zealand parliamentarians today. But just imagine how much more intimidating your task would have been in Germany in 1945. There were many people who believed back then that a government-run recovery would be the way forward. Practically in the whole of Europe, governments took the lead in planning for their nation's recoveries. Not so in Germany, because Germany had a group of economists around Ludwig Erhard. Erhard knew that Germany would only recover if the recovery grew from the bottom up. It couldn't be planned for by the government, and Erhard knew that it would only be a recovery deserving its name if it brought prosperity for all. Prosperity for all was more than a slogan. It was more than the title of Erhard's famous book. It was the essence of Erhard's policies. Economic policy is not about propping up some big companies. It's not about preserving the privileges of the few. It is not about the government picking winners and controlling the economy. No, the ultimate goal of economic policy is to bring hope and prosperity to all people. Ludwig Erhard achieved this. Under his leadership as economics minister and later as chancellor, the country experienced a boom like never before. It was a true economic miracle. Germany caught up with and then overtook Britain's GDP per capita. It had full employment and became one of the world's strongest export nations. So you may now wonder what was Erhard's miracle recipe? What did he do to turn the ruins of an economy into an economic powerhouse? And what can we in New Zealand learn from this? The truth is there was no miracle formula. Erhard did not micromanage the economy. He did not control individual industries. He did not print money to finance his projects, nor did he pay favors to any businesses. Erhard followed a principles-based approach, which he called the social market economy. And that is the approach I recommend to New Zealand today. Erhard's friend and economist colleague Walter Eucken distilled seven principles of the social market economy. A functioning price system, monetary stability, open markets, secure private property rights, freedom of contract, liability for one's actions and commitments, and steadiness of economic policy. Each of these seven principles is as relevant to us today as it was in 1945. If we follow these principles, we can build New Zealand's recovery and bring prosperity to all New Zealanders.
on many of these principles, New Zealand has done well in the past. But in the face of this crisis, we must do even better now. As Ernest Rutherford said, we haven't got the money, so we'll have to think. So let me illustrate what I mean. We've just had our tourism industry thrown into disarray by COVID-19. It will not return in its previous size for many years. This means the worst we could do now is to pretend we could preserve tourism as it once was. Instead, we should allow the factors of production, capital, labor, and land to rearrange. That needs property rights and freedom of contract. We will also need to strengthen property rights and freedom of contract for infrastructure projects and house building. That means simplifying our planning procedures. We cannot afford bureaucratic delays in our economic rebuild. Take another example, open markets. New Zealand has a proud tradition of being a free trading nation. Our crisis must not change this. We should see trade and investment as an opportunity to grow out of this crisis. While other countries are still struggling, our status as a potentially COVID-free haven will help us. Our food exports could reap a COVID-free premium. Our education exports could do as well. We must allow this to happen, which is why we should reopen our borders to international students quickly and allow them to attend our universities after a mandatory two-week quarantine. In a similar way, we need to be even more open in our dealings with the world. We will need heaps of capital to rebuild our economy and so we should sus suspend the clumsy rules on foreign direct investment. We should send a signal to the world that we welcome investment and investors. Finally, I want to stress the importance of monetary stability and steadiness of economic policy. We've all heard that central banks are to create unimaginable sums of money, but that can easily deliver the opposite of monetary stability. Especially in a crisis, the public must know it can trust the independence of the Reserve Bank and its commitment to long-term price stability. There is a political temptation to use this crisis for political pet projects, especially if funding for them comes from the Reserve Bank. Yet that would be a grave mistake. It would also be a big mistake to spend money on projects just because they are shovel-ready. What distinguishes a good project from a bad one so the good project's benefits are greater than its costs. Mm. New Zealanders must be able to trust in the steadiness of economic policy. Ludwig Erhard once said that 50% of economics is psychology. We therefore need a government that is predictable and steady. The last thing we need is political policy uncertainty, political surprises or monetary experiments. What we do need is a recovery based on sound economic principles. This was the strategy that propelled Germany's economic miracle, but it's also an approach proven right in many other crises since. In 2016, Danish economist Christian Björnskov analyzed 212 crises in 175 countries over the period from 1993 to 2010. His findings, published in the European Journal of Political Economy, vindicate Ludwig Erhard's earlier insight. Countries with better economic institutions experienced more moderate crises than others, and they also recovered faster. We should take heart from this study, and we should hold on to those timeless principles of good economic policy I described earlier. Nobody knows what exactly our future will look like, but we do know that an economic framework with secure property rights, sound money, competition, freedom of contract, open markets, and a functioning price system will give us the flexibility we need to weather the storms, and grow out of this crisis. This is the best way towards a bright future for New Zealand, a future that will deliver prosperity for all. Thank you. I thank you so much, Oliver. That's excellent. And uh, I think we can all agree uh, exactly as you said, that in the face of this crisis, we must do even better now. Um, Nikki Kay. Uh, look, my first, uh, well, I've got a question for Max and then a question for Oliver. Um, my first question for you, Max, is really around uh, equality and thinking and reflecting on New Zealand's traditional issues of inequality uh, around both the rural urban divide, but also intergenerational um, equality. And I, I think a lot of us are sitting here as parliamentarians trying to work out what might be some of those larger policy uh, interventions that could make a difference. We heard from Rod Drury 
around the role of digital infrastructure, potentially some of those technology trends. Um, uh, you know, could you comment around what you think uh, we can do uh, during this period um, at the digital level to uh, potentially um, uh, reduce some of the inequality that's existed? Because that's one of the fears that I have is that if we don't get that right, we'll see more and more people slip behind. The second issue is around that issue of intergenerational equality. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to look back and say, have we been proportionate in our response? And this issue of people in hospitality and retail um, worries a lot of people because of um, inequality, but also um, the issue of, uh, and this, you know, we'll finish here in terms of the question, this issue of, of people who might be the casualties of COVID-19, such as tertiary students, um, the gap between the unemployment benefit and what they're on. And just if you could comment on that, whether you think the government's done enough around uh, uh, groups of people like tertiary students. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for, for the questions, both of which are excellent. Um, on the sort of general questions of, of divides that you raise, I think those are very, very real issues. And one that's really struck me um, and is very, very relevant, of course, to the um, the portfolios that you have held is around education um, and the issues is that a very large number of, of families, particularly those in poverty, um, don't have home internet access. Um, I think we've always known that that's existed, but that's been, come very much to the forefront. And I've been very pleased to see the Ministry of Education bring in some you know, temporary emergency measures, trying to roll out devices trying to improve the connectivity. I think once we're through the crisis, we need to take a really hard look at that and think about access to the internet as potentially now a, a fundamental human right. Some people would disagree with that, but I think it is so fundamental now that it's coming up into that kind of category of essential rights. And basically looking to extend free broadband um, to communities where people are just not going to be able to afford internet connections in the short term, if for no other reason than we owe it to the children in those families that their education is not held back through no fault um, of their own. Uh, on the intergenerational question, I think that's also an excellent one. I guess um, what has marked the lives of a lot of people my age, um, I'm in my late 30s, or people my age are slightly younger, is a much greater instability in their lives, core aspects of their lives, than was experienced by the immediately post-war generation. And that probably picks up on things I mentioned in my opening remarks, but, you know, instability about the question, when will they be able, ever be able to own a home? Uh, instability about their work and their prospects. And so I would, I mean, for me, a lot of it revolves around work and for all the government's future of work commissions, um, I don't think we've even really addressed the most basic question, which is what is good flexible work that we accept and want to see continue? What is bad precarious work that we mm. want to say is unacceptable because of the costs that it poses on people? We haven't really even had that question uh, discussed. And then beneath that, I think we need to do a lot more to give some stability to people's working lives uh, make it easier for them to show that they are actually an employee, not a contractor, for instance. Make it easier for them to access benefits, all those kinds of issues. And I think that's particularly important, as you say, for the young people in areas like hospitality. You know, and I just, um, my, my question for Oliver, um, can I just acknowledge as well the work that the New Zealand Institute has done in education? Uh, really two-prong in the education, uh, the role of education and recovery. Uh, the first part is around what you have mentioned and our international uh, student sector, obviously billions of dollars um, that uh, a range of people are coming up with proposals. So if you could comment more on how you see um, post-COVID uh, working uh, with the international uh, sector and what the opportunity might be for um, additional students to come through via quarantine. But also, um, if you could comment on what you think the opportunities are for New Zealand around online export education. And then the other component of this, which is much larger, which is 
how do we potentially uh, deal with the growing number of people on the unemployment benefit? What's the role of um, upskilling, training through this period? Um, given the vocational reforms that have occurred, we've got huge disruption in that sector. What do you think are some of the things that we should be working through uh, to ensure that we have as many people um, upskilling and potentially um, powering up those small businesses in New Zealand rather than being uh, necessarily and wealthier? Well, thank you, Nikki. Um, very good questions. Uh, to address your first question first, I believe that we need to do something about reopening our universities to international students, as I mentioned before, because our universities are so heavily dependent on um, revenue from international students. And it is not just the revenue that they bring in directly through student fees, but also, of course, because our universities are uh, providers of accommodation to students. So I've had discussions in the last um, week or so with um, a vice chancellor and a chancellor of two different universities. And what I've heard from them was um, a very clear picture that uh, the universities will definitely need to see a return of those students because otherwise the financial viability will be in, in question. So I think it is safe to start with a program where incoming international students would go into a mandatory quarantine. I also believe that our universities would be able to handle this quarantine themselves because they have the accommodation that would allow them uh, to actually do this themselves, of course, with support from the Ministry of Health. The other question we had on the, procure, uh, on the pro provision of digital learning, this is something we could look into in the future, but I think um, it is probably too early really to say whether there's um, much revenue potential in this. I think my priority would actually be on reopening our universities so we can get our tertiary education exports going again soon. Fantastic. Thank you very much. David Seymour. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, look, thank you, Max and Oliver. If, if I could just uh, ask a question or two of uh, Dr. Hartwich. Um, it's a really interesting story about the social market economy. And, and it's always amazed me that Germany or West Germany, at least, became so wealthy so quickly with BMWs and all of the, the luxuries that, that seem to emerge despite total devastation. Um, I just wonder, though, you know, what about other countries? I mean, you know, New Zealanders in particular, or at least many of us, uh, have close ties to Britain. Um, can you tell us a bit about, you know, their approach? Yes, um, thank you, David. Um, I can tell you about Britain because I actually spent some time in Britain myself. I lived and worked there for almost five years. And uh, the comparison between Britain and Germany is fascinating because, of course, Britain had won the war. They also, by the way, received more money from the Marshall Fund uh, from the United States after the war. And yet the trajectory that both Britain and Germany uh, embarked on in 1945 couldn't have been more different. So as I already um, sketched earlier, Germany recovered quickly, uh, strongly, and about 10, 15 years after the war, unemployment was down to, I think it was 0.8% in Germany. In Britain, that was a different story because Britain had a change of government, of course, in 45 straight after the war. They elected in Clement Attlee as prime minister who embarked on a program of nationalizations, um, even nationalized the Bank of England, nationalized key industries, try to really control the recovery out of Whitehall and um, accompany that with lots of regulations that crippled the economy long run. So by 1969, Germany, which had always had lower GDP per capita than Britain, had overtaken Britain. And then the 1970s, of course, um, were terrible for Britain. They had the three-day week, they had a bailout from the International Monetary Fund in 1976, and the whole thing culminated in 1978-1979 in the winter of discontent. And of course, that was um, the final crisis that actually brought Margaret Thatcher to power. So if you just look at the experience of Britain, um, Britain chose the opposite path. It took a very controlled path. And, you know, the narrative at the time in Britain was, um, we won the war and now we want to win the peace. So what the Brits tried to do was they tried to take the same tools that helped them win the war, this full mobilization of the state, the full power of the state and direct it now to peacetime activities. And that didn't work. The Germans took the opposite approach. I mean, they had lost the war and they were quite suspicious now of the state, of course, after the catastrophe of national socialism and therefore 
German de developed a lot faster. But by the way, it is not just the British experience you can take um, and compare Germany with. You could also look at France. They went for planification. That was also a very strong role for the state, for the government to control the economy. You could look at practically every other European country. Germany was really the outlier post-World War II. And you can see that actually Germany worked. Germany had the hardest currency. Germany had the best employment results for the next 20, 30 years. So I think history is quite rich. If we are seeing our current COVID crisis as some kind of war against the virus, which in many ways it is, then I think it is only appropriate to also draw historic lessons from previous um, post-war recovery periods. And I think I cannot imagine a better example to follow than Ludwig Erhard and the social market economy. Well, thank you. Um, can I just pick up on something you said about cost-benefit analysis? Um, and normally I, I totally go along with what you're saying, but I just want to put to you a view that I've heard out there that um, we don't need cost-benefit analysis at the moment because um, cost-benefit analysis assumes there are real costs. Uh, in the current circumstance, uh, there are no costs because the, the Reserve Bank can, can print money and monetize government debt and, and fund government expenditure um, almost for free. So why would we bother analyzing cost-benefit analysis? Uh, why not, for instance, become a leader in electric aircraft, uh, expand 5G, um, build a lot more water storage capacity? Because, hey, it's all free, right? Oh, David. <laughs> well, um, to that, I would say that if there has, had ever been a time when cost-benefit analysis was needed, it is today. Because we can already see uh, that this crisis is going to be extremely costly to the New Zealand government. It will really stretch our public finances. So we simply cannot afford to fund projects that will have no long-term benefit. We really need to do cost-benefit analysis also because there are so many interesting ideas floating around. I mean, I listened to Rod Drury earlier, and a lot of what he said sounded um, absolutely appealing. But yet, what we need to do for each individual project, we need to figure out whether the costs exceed uh, benefits or whether it's the other way around. And um, I heard, for example, a figure floating around that there are now infrastructure projects worth about $100 billion proposed. Well, if that's the figure, we, we can see that we cannot fund all of them. So we should start funding the best of them that actually yield the biggest benefit to New Zealand, the economy. And um, we should definitely have to prioritize what we want to do. Just finally, uh, Simon anticipated that you would violently disagree with each other on everything, but I'm, I'm really pleased to see that, that Max and, and Oliver are, are opposed to a universal basic income, which personally annoys me because I think it's the, the silliest and most persistent policy out there. Uh, but then Max said that um, out of it, David. he's in favor of a, a guaranteed minimum income. Um, what, what, Max, could you just explain to us what's the difference between a guaranteed minimum income and a, and a UBI? Because I, I, I'm on board with the idea that there needs to be some thinking about how social insurance works in a modern world with different types of work and much better technology for um, you know, adjusting it in real time. But, but how does this guaranteed minimum income work? The, the key difference is that it's not universal, um, which for me is the great supposedly the great appeal of the universal basic income, but also its great um, sticking point. Because if you deliver something to absolutely everyone in the population, you have to spread the support very thinly. So the guaranteed minimum income is basically, it's about removing a lot of the intrusive means testing and the conditionality uh, that um, a lot of people find very demeaning in the current welfare system. It's about making the benefit more generous so that you can actually lead a decent life and participate in the life of your society and have some sort of level of dignity, a little bit like what New Zealand Super affords to people. Uh, but as you earn, but it's, it's only for people who have no other means of support. So like a classic benefit, it's clawed back from people or abated as their income from work increases. Thank okay, you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for both the speakers. Thank you very much. Let's go to Michael Wood. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Max, I just want to come to you initially. And in your opening comments, you spoke about the risks that uh, after an economic shock like this, a chasm can open up or, or be significantly deepened between those who get by OK and those who are really left behind. Um, now, most of us just sort of instinctively think, well, that's a bad thing. Can you actually just explain to the committee briefly about why you think in social and economic terms 
that is, an, that is a damaging thing to occur as a result of one of these crises, not just for uh, the national income to be lowered, but for gaps to deepen. Why is it actually a problem? Well, I guess you can look at that in a, in a number of ways. I mean, there's all the questions about whether that's fair or not. Um, and many people would feel that it isn't. That if something happens to you that is not under your control at all, that it should be much more damaging in your life than it is for others. Um, but just sort of focusing on the, the, the practical outcomes, I guess, you can look at it through the lens of the individual and of the society. So for an individual, you know, obviously um, having a massive economic shock uh, can plunge you into poverty. And, you know, and look, and we've heard from the Auckland City Mission talking about how many more parcels it's giving out uh, from its food banks. And they're seeing a lot of people who have been in work, people who've been in precarious work. So, you know, a big, a big shock can really, it can be incredibly, and the effects of, of being in poverty for children are long lasting, sometimes, you know, last their entire lives. So there's enormous damage it can do to individuals, but I also think it really damages the fabric of society. You know, the greater is the imbalance between rich and poor. Um, you know, the more you have those extremes, the less people see of each other's lives, the less empathy they have for others, um, the less they feel a connection to how the other half lives. And so you end up with a more competitive society. Uh, you end up with more people who just feel like, you know, even the median way of life is out of reach. And so they have greater levels of despair and hopelessness. Um, I think it raises real questions about social cohesion. You get higher rates of social problems like high imprisonment rates or high teenage pregnancy rates, all these responses to despair, a more punitive society. And in the end, I think you have a problem for democracy as well. Because, you know, when, when you go to vote or you give your opinion on a policy, the laws and policies will affect everyone in the country. But if you, if you live very far apart from other people, and that can be rich living far apart from poor, poor live far apart, living far apart from rich, you don't actually know enough about other people's lives to have any idea about how that law will affect everyone. And so I think the very practice of our democracy is threatened by very wide inequality. Okay. I want to ask you, that was very helpful, thank you. I want to ask you about um, the model of social assistant, social income assistance uh, that we currently have. Um, you've spoken, you spoke a bit about your ancestor Harry Atkinson and his thoughts on a national insurance scheme, which of course is different from the kind of universal payment scheme that we have, wealthy system that we have at the moment. There are arguments for something like a national insurance scheme that by its contributory nature, people kind of buy into it. You don't have so many arguments about who's worthy and who's not worthy. On the other hand, it's more complicated than um, probably than a, a welfare system of the kind that we have uh, at the moment. Do you have any views on which might be the most durable track of those two? And just with particular reference to some of the con concerns and issues that you've raised around people in precarious work and the fact that that's um, uh, an increased issue in our society and our economy at the moment, which of those models might help us to meet uh, the gaps that seem to arise in people's lives more often uh, in this environment? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good question. And it is always, you know, a question that when you're designing a welfare state that you face, I think the, the lessons internationally um, are pretty clear that most welfare systems make use of a combination of those two things. They have payments that are just there when you need them and they aren't related to what you might have contributed through the tax system. And so our unemployment benefit is a classic example of that. But in most countries, yeah, there are also basically, to be really crude about it, higher payments available through the welfare system for people who have paid more in specific taxes. And the average OECD country, I think, gets about 25% of its tax revenue from what are called social security contributions. Uh, we effectively get none. So we're a real outlier, although those calculations don't count ACC, which arguably is, is similar to those kinds of things. So I, I think there is an argument for having more of those contributory schemes. Um, because I mean, I think there's a need to do more for people at the bottom who haven't been able to make contributions. 
But I do think, although people often attack middle class welfare as a bad thing, that's one of the things that a lot of welfare systems have always been designed to do because middle class people go through ups and downs, the alternating cycles of poverty and plenty that the British identified um, in the late 19th century. And they do need help to smooth out those ups and downs, even if they're middle class. So I think there, in New Zealand, there would be a role for some specific like national insurance taxes, even on middle earners, as long as people can see that in return, they would get greater benefits. So that for instance, if you have a middle-class lifestyle, you lose your job, you don't suffer that massive drop in income that is so destabilizing. There is actually something there that tops up your income to a greater proportion of the wages you formerly enjoyed, keeps you on the level, keeps your family together until you're able to get back into the work. Did develop a pretty comprehensive welfare system, uh, had strong trade unions to ensure an equity of income within that period, and that uh, the characterization of it as a social market economy is accurate, but actually what created that wasn't necessarily just the, the list of market liberal values that you, you listed during your uh, discourse. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, there are certainly elements in what you described that are true. For example, that Germany has had strong trade unions, not so strong anymore today, I would say, and they behave broadly responsibly, um, especially also in the post-war period. That is absolutely true. It's also true what you say that Germany built up a, a social welfare state alongside, except I would say that happened much later. That happened really starting in 1957 when Germany introduced a much more generous pension scheme, which Ludwig Erhard, by the way, opposed. Um, but before that, um, that was not really the case. It was a relatively smaller um, welfare state. And actually, Germany didn't even need much of a welfare state anyway, because unemployment rates, um, they were um, quite low, actually, soon after Erhard started his reforms. So I think you can still say that Germany was a very liberal approach um, post-1949, um, well, really, when the Federal Republic was constituted. And um, definitely you can see this in comparison with the other European examples that I mentioned earlier. But I would concede, of course, that Germany developed on, and especially then in the late 1960s and 1970s, it became a very mixed market economy that probably doesn't have much to do anymore with the ideals that um, actually Ludwig Erhard held. Thank you. Thank you good discussion. Much. Could go on, but I'll leave it there. No, very good. Appreciate it. Uh, look, there are many others that want questions. We're just going to go finally to Judith Collins. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Oliver and Matt. Really um, great contribution. Um, Oliver, could I ask you to discuss um, what I thought about the government? The yeah. uh, for businesses. Um, I'll speak up a bit. Um, one of the issues that I'm hearing, particularly from small businesses, that other than the wage subsidy, there is very little people in business the longer that this lockdown goes on. And we know that we're moving to stage three next week, but that's not going to save a lot of businesses. Now, one of the points that's been made to me, which I thought this sounds quite effective, was that businesses did not bring COVID-19 in. It was not responsible for uh, treating people when they came into the country. It was not Judith, Judith, there's just something wrong with the sound, unfortunately. I don't know if... if uh, okay, um, just keeping a lot. It's like, even though we know you're not, it's like you're eating a packet of crisps while you... No, that's no good. I. How's this? Is this better? If I sit back a bit, is that better? I think we may. I'm sorry. I I, I wanted to hear it very much. Yeah, that was very good too. It was going to be very good. I feel like we might call that quits. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, I might have to email Oliver. Thank you. It, it, the, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it.